Talmudim way, adding cultural, historic, and geographic significance to your walk as a disciple of Jesus. Our next lesson is the Nazarene. We'll be in Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. Acts 17.11 reminds us to receive the word with all eagerness, but examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Don't take anyone's word for it, but check it out for yourself against the scriptures. And now our blessing. God, we praise you for your intricately designed word, which teaches us how to follow you as disciples. Now guard our minds and guard our hearts. Draw us closer to you as we study and let us study so that we may become disciples that are doers of your word and not hearers only. Give us all Acts 1711 discernment. And we ask this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. So we're continuing with the childhood narratives of Jesus. We'll look at Herod and the wise men, and that results in the Holy Family's flight to Egypt, and then they will end up being supernaturally called out of Egypt, just as the uh, Israelites of old were called out in the Passover. So uh, there's some parallels there. Then they return to Nazareth, and then we'll conclude with looking at the 12-year-old Jesus at the temple. Matthew's narrative is going to begin with a visit from the Magi from the east. And we aren't told exactly where. Um, you can see Israel here, so lots of things are east of that. Scholars think maybe uh, Persia or Parthia here, or possibly um, Arabia down here. Frankincense and myrrh are generally more associated with Arabia, but that doesn't mean the Magi had to come from Arabia, although they certainly could have. We're going to see that Herod in all Jerusalem was in an uproar, which to some suggest that uh, Herod may have thought a Parthian invasion was imminent. So Rome and Parthia were traditional enemies, and just three guys on camels would have not caused the whole city to be in uproar, but we'll bust that myth when we get to it. After uh, the Magi's visit, then the Holy Family then is told by an angel to flee to Egypt. And there is a was a large Jewish uh, settlement in Alexandria. So we don't know exactly where they went in Egypt, but um, and Al Alexandria is a good guess. In a sense, we can say the entire Bible is all about usurpers. And this started way back in the garden with the serpent tri tricking uh, Mr. and Mrs. Man into thinking that their way was better than God's ways. Um, Herod is the phony king of the Jews who isn't even Jewish, while that's contrasted with Jesus, who is the rightful one who is actually born king of the Jews, just as the Magi were looking for. Herod represents darkness while Jesus represents light. At this point in Matthew 2, the evil king is hunting down the, the rightful king, and the, the rightful king must relocate to Egypt to, to uh, safety. We believe the Old Testament Joseph would have followed along the way of the sea called the Via Maris down here, while uh, Jacob and family would have used the way of the patriarchs here. Given that Bethlehem lies along the way of the patriarchs, it's reasonable to suspect that the Holy Family used the same road as Jacob when they fled to Egypt. So Herod dies in 4 BC, and his kingdom is divided among his three surviving sons, the ones he didn't have killed, uh, Archelaus, Antipas and Philip. Archelaus gets the, the heart of the country here in Judea and Samaria. Antipas gets two non-connected territories here, Galilee and then down here in Perea. And then Philip gets this area up to the northeast. So after the sojourn in Egypt, the text appears to indicate that the first choice would have been to have the Holy Family go back to Bethlehem. However, the Holy Spirit directs them up to Nazareth to avoid the problems associated with Archelaus. Archelaus was every bit as ruthless as his father Herod was, really cut from the same cloth. On the first Passover that he was in charge, he massacred about a thousand worshipers and let their bodies to rot out in the sun on the Temple Mount. And you just didn't do that. You always respected uh, the, the right of burial. So he was bad news. He was so awful that Rome replaced him in the year AD 6 with the governors, or you might see them called procurators. The procurator we know best is Pontius Pilate. Archelaus' brother Antipas was, at, the, at least at this time, not as bad as, uh, as Archelaus, although during Jesus' adult ministry, Antipas does cause uh, a fair share of trouble for the disciples. He's the one who beheads John the Baptist, and he's the Herod who mocks Jesus the night of his arrest after asking for a miracle. So from here on out, usually when we see Herod mentioned in the Gospels, it's going to refer to this Herod Antipas. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born 
king of the Jews, or the, we use the Greek word eudaioi, for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The Magi were pagan astrologers whose divinatory skills were widely respected in the Greco-Roman world. Astrology had become popular through the science of the East, and as Keener writes, everyone agreed the best astrologers lived in the East. Isaiah references this in 2 verse 6. It says they are full of things from the East, and of course for Jews, that's not a good thing because they're supposed to follow God, not, not pagan div divination. Um, as we mentioned before, there's this possible dig at Herod when they ask, who, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod was not born Jewish, and he was not born a king. Uh, he was an, an Edomite, and he was appointed by Rome. So this is a, a way of saying, where's the real king? You know, not you, Herod. Where's that real king? Um, that the Messiah would be signified by a star goes back to Numbers 24, and a prophecy by Balaam, who was also a Gentile. Uh, Numbers 24, 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be be born. So as we said earlier, it could have been the threat of military incursion from Parthia, or it could simply be a situation that if, if Herod ain't happy, then ain't nobody happy. Uh, rumors of a new king would have spread quickly, and many would have been ready to join a political incursion. Herod just was not popular. He very much hated among the people. So again, the Bible does not say there were three wise men. The fact that all Jerusalem was in an uproar means it's unlikely that three guys on camels would have caused all that. There were three gifts, but not three wise men. There is a tradition that Daniel put all of this in motion when he was placed in an executive role in Daniel chapter 6. So ultimately, we don't know whether the Magi were from Parthia, Arabia, Babylon, or somewhere else, but there is that tradition that um, Daniel was placed over the Magi, and the speculation is that he planted this uh, this prophecy with the team there, and it was passed on generation to generation, that when you see the star, it's time to move out and head over to Judea. The scribes told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The scribes had the head knowledge that Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, but note that they don't do anything with this knowledge. They've even received a sign that from God that this birth had occurred, and yet you know they, they did nothing <laughs> to, in, in reaction to it. So there's a huge difference in knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus him, himself. Matthew, as he tends to do, does not precisely quote Micah 5.2, but he actually adds in the text of 2 Samuel 5.2 regarding a shepherd. So Micah 5.2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathath, who are too little from to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth one who is to be ruler in Israel. 2 Samuel is about David, where the Lord said to David, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. In Judaism, this is called a midrash, and a midrash connects two verses on a common word or a common theme, even when that common commonality is not obvious by the plain reading of the text. So we could rephrase this as the ruler coming forth from Bethlehem is Messiah, son of David, who will shepherd Israel just as David of Bethlehem did. So here's a picture of a shepherd with a flock from modern times. It's a very common scene in Israel today, and it was very common back in, the, back in Jesus' day. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring, him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So, spoiler alert, Herod has no intention of bowing down to Jesus. He never hesitated to murder anyone who he saw as a threat to Rome. Uh, so instead of favorably reacting to the news Messiah was born, Herod not unlike other pagan rulers of his day, attempted to divine from the stars information about his personal fate. The ancients thought that comets and falling stars predicted the fall of rulers, and some emperors even banished astrologers who issued such predictions. Uh, the warning, the full warning, Isaiah 2, you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east and of fortune tellers. 
After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So Bethlehem was only six miles away and pretty easy to find, but yet they are led by a star, which in a sense is reminiscent of the Israelites being led in the wilderness by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And going into the house, so we see that the family found permanent lodging now they saw the child with mary his mother and they fell down and worshiped him they opened their treasures and they offered him gifts gold frankincense and myrrh and being warned in a dream not to return to herod they departed to their country by another way so isaiah in chapter 60 prophesied the bringing of gold and frankincense and he says the multitude of camels shall cover you the young camels of Midian, Epoph, and uh, those from Sheba, all of those are places in Arabia. And uh, frankincense and myrrh are both, I guess, indigenous, we might say, to the, the, um, the area of Arabia. Psalm 45, your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. And so on the picture on the right is a clump of myrrh. Um, so the three gifts here are likely where we get the tradition of three wise men. We, we picture one, uh, one gift for one, one guy on one camel. Um, although we often picture treasure shows of gold being presented like the hoard in the picture on the left there. Scripture doesn't say how much gold was provided to them or what happened to it. And we have just no indication that the family had any wealth at all <laughs> during, um, during Jesus' childhood or after. Myrrh had a number of uses in the Bible, um, incense in Exodus, anointing perfume in Psalms, as we just saw, uh, cosmetic in Esther, anesthetic in Mark 15, and then embalming in John 16, 39. So gold would speak of Jesus's kingship, frankincense would speak of his, his priestly aspects, and then from the gospel references, it's fair to conclude that myrrh speaks of his suffering and death, although the kings of Israel were anointed with myrrh oil, and specifically Song of Songs describes Solomon perfumed, perfumed with both myrrh and frankincense in Song of, Song, Song of Songs uh, chapter 3, verse 6. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Genesis 37 says the Old Testament Joseph also was taken to Egypt, and uh, there are literally over a hundred different ways that the lives of the Old Testament Joseph and Jesus are connected. Uh, we'll see that both not only had a, a time in Egypt, but both were carried off to Egypt, we could say, at the hands of Ishmaelites. So Edomites, uh, which is what Herod was, and Ishmaelites are interrelated. So it says here in uh, 30, Genesis thirty-seven twenty-eight that the Ishmaelites carried Joseph to Egypt and Jesus fled at the hand of Herod the Edomite. We also see that both were lowered and lifted out of a pit, and we'll, we'll see this later when Jesus was imprisoned by Caiaphas. Uh, we believe he was thrown into a pit in, in prison, and then both were sold for pieces of silver. So lots of different ways that uh, biblical Old Testament Joseph and Jesus' uh, lives are, are parallel. And he, uh, Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And Matthew is quoting Hosea 11 verse 1, When Israel was a child I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So this verse is about the, the ancient Israelites, but Matthew's point here is that Jesus epitomizes and fulfills Israel's history. Isaiah narrow, narrows down the mission of Israel as a whole to one who can ultimately fulfill that mission and suffer on behalf of the whole people, and that would be Jesus. So one aspect that we can miss is that when Jesus or Matthew or Luke or any of the Old Test or New Testament authors references a small segment of one verse, the original audience would have more than likely understood the entire passage. So at first blush, out of Egypt, I've called my son sounds like a triumphant moment but if you read the entire chapter notice the sadness that God has for his people who reject him despite his constant calling healing loving kindness and provision the more they were called the more they went away they kept sacrificing to the bales and burning offerings to idols yet I was 
it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. So you can see hear God's pain through this entire passage. And so there's a hint of pain uh, right here in Matthew 2 that he is being chased away by the leader of, of the Jews by name only, and um, he had to flee to Egypt. So this is how God feels when, when we act <laughs> ungrateful and stiff neck. So uh, God called Israel and he calls us, and we need to make sure we're answering his call. Lots of fables and traditions arose out of the Holy Family's time in Egypt. So this is a modern mosaic in the courtyard of a church in Cairo that depicts Joseph, Mary, and Jesus traveling along the, the banks of the Nile. And if you look closely, you can see the pyramids of Giza are in the background of this mosaic. So our memory verse is Matthew 2.15, out of Egypt I have called my son. And here Matthew is reminding his audience that Jesus relates to them and he relates to us. We can miss this as Gentiles, but the Passover and the time and the exodus from Egypt is just a huge deal to Jews, and, and rightly so. God commands his people to be reminded of God's faithfulness and deliverance through this annual remembrance. And then here Matthew's pointing out that just as the nation suffered persecution so the messiah you know fled to egypt to flee persecution and then just as moses the deliverer arose to free the nation and and lead them from physical bondage out of egypt so a messiah delivers us from spiritual bondage that messiah is jesus lots of parallels between moses and jesus both miraculously survived attempts to murder them both were visited by royalty at the time of their birth so if we remember moses was in the the nile and was found by the daughter of pharaoh moses carried the law which and the law purpose of the law points to the gospel and jesus fulfilled the law and jesus is the gospel both spent time in the wilderness before their public ministries, both miraculously calmed waters, both fed people with bread. So there's just all, all these parallels going on through Moses. And, and ultimately, Jesus says in John 5, 46, if you believe Moses, you would believe me for Moses wrote about me. So our verse here connects Jesus with the rich history of Moses and the Torah. And we're reminded also that in a, in a type sense, Egypt is always seen as a type of the world. So Jesus and Moses led, led their people out of the world and into the, the promised land of uh, being uh, blessed by God and being obedient to God. So remember Matthew 2, 15. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all in that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. And certainly the parallel is there with, with Pharaoh. We have the Holy Family in Egypt, so there's this connection here. Pharaoh gave a similar command only to have God's appointed deliverer miraculously escape that decree. Uh, so Pharaoh commanded, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast in the Nile. Uh, but just as Moses was saved in the waters of the Nile, so too did Jesus escape the Nile, across the Nile to safety. We don't have any extra biblical documentation of what is known as the slaughter of the innocents, um, but even biblical skeptics have to conclude that this behavior of Herod's flying into a rage and ordering executions is, is just entirely consistent with everything we know about Herod. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, and Matthew is quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 15 here. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, for they are no more. This is another example where Matthew takes a verse from the Hebrew Bible that was never considered messianic, and he's saying it applies to Jesus. So Jeremiah imagines Rachel weeping for her children as they were carried off to Babylon. Rachel actually lived a thousand years before the Babylonian captivity and was the favorite wife of Jacob. Matthew states that Rachel of Bethlehem had cause to mourn again by this act of Herod. And what's interesting is that the soldiers likely passed right by Rachel's tomb both before and after the massacre. Um, Rachel died in childbirth while giving birth to Benjamin uh, near Bethlehem. So it's interesting that in um, before, way back in Genesis, Joseph is, is now the prime minister of Egypt and his brothers come down in, in search of food. Joseph specifically asked for Benjamin to be brought down. And this just breaks Jacob's heart because he says, Joseph is no more. And then in chapter uh, 42, verse 36 of Genesis, basically Joseph is no more, Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. In other words, Rachel's children, Joseph and Benjamin, are no more in a figurative sense. 
But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother to go to the land of Israel, for those who are sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. And certainly this is a reminiscent of the Passover, the Exodus, uh, where they left with haste, they left Egypt and ultimately arrived in the land of Israel. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Being warned in a dream, he, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. On the surface, this prophecy by Matthew is puzzling. There's no passage in the Old Testament anywhere that says he shall be called a Nazarene. Therefore, the skeptics conclude that Matthew was either misinformed or he fabricated the whole story. But the key in understanding this is that the root word for Nazareth is netzer, which means branch or sprout. And this word is used in Isaiah 11.1. 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And then he, uh, we, we can link in Zechariah 3.8. Jeremiah 23 5 and, and several others that talk about this branch I will bring my servant the branch in Zechariah in Jeremiah I will raise up for David a righteous branch so in other words Matthew is not referencing just one prophecy and we get a clue of this because why where it says shall be spoken of by the prophets plural in no other citation does he he say prophets he always says prophet or the name of the prophet but here he communicates the substance of of several prophets. And this will uh, have a segue into Luke, where we have our parallel passage here. When they had performed everything according to the law, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. We're in Nazareth, and here you can see a modern uh, picture of the city. We have no reason not to think that Jesus would not have had a relatively normal childhood. Um, around five, he would have started studying and learning to memorize the Torah, and uh, as he was older, he would have begun memorizing the rest of the Hebrew Tanakh. Also from an early age, he would have begun to learn wood or stoneworking, studying alongside of his father, Joseph. The village carpenter would have helped to build roofs, doors, windows, and stairs for the houses. Uh, he would have made furniture, serving implements for the home, and possibly yokes, hitches, and plows for the animals in the field. As Nazareth was relatively small, maybe only a couple hundred people, we speculate that Joseph probably found the bulk of his work in the nearby town of Sephoris. And you can see on the map, it's about an hour's walk from Nazareth. Uh, Sephoris is another uh, first century town. It was rebuilt and fortified uh, after Galilee came under the rule of Antipas. So Antipas made it his capital and started to rebuild it. So scholars theorize that Joseph and Jesus may have helped in this reconstruction of Sephoris. Um, probably, again, stonework. Stone is the main building craft of the area. Joseph living in Nazareth was probably a builder in stone as well as wood. So Sephoris needed craftsmen, and so it, it makes sense that Joseph and Jesus might have worked uh, up in Sephoris. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. We know from uh, Jewish writings, and you can see the Pirkei Avot here, at five years of age, they would start the study of Scripture, at 10 years, the study of Mishnah, or the commentaries, and then at 13, subject to the commandments. So Jesus was considered to have come of age when he reached 12 or 13. Another way of thinking of 12 is after his 12th year, or in other words, 13. Jewish life revolved around the biblical calendar, and the Torah prescribes three feasts that are compulsory for every able-bodied Jewish male. Passover in the early spring, Shavuot in the late spring, and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles in the, in the early fall. Passover is considered the most important, and as Luke indicates, Joseph and Mary made this trek annually. And even today, ethnic Jews who aren't especially religious, they do tend to participate in Passover. Uh, David Stern notes that tradition made allowances for folks far away, including granting an exception to the Torah requirement. Um, so traveling 80, 90 miles you know, might have met this exception. But despite this, uh, the, the Bible notes that Joseph and Mary kept the law diligently and went to the, the Passover in Jerusalem every year. 
Jesus' first Passover ceremony would have included offering his first sacrifice in the temple. Probably no more than a few coins for a bird offering, but still it's a sacrifice. So by now, Mary and Joseph would have probably had many children, and maybe all seven that are referenced in Matthew 13, um, 55 through 59. During the Passover meal, which is called a Seder, it's easy to imagine Joseph and Mary delighting their kids and other relatives around uh, with the tale of their flight in Egypt and their miraculous exodus, just as the same as the Passover story recounts. So that's kind of fun to think about. Today, uh, Jewish boys celebrate their bar mitzvahs at the Western Wall Prayer Plaza, and you can see that uh, the picture here. Um, girls have what's called a bat mitzvah, which is very similar. Bar means son of the commandment, uh, bat mitzvah means daughter of the commandment. So in the photo above, a, the 13-year-old is wearing, is learning to wear the phylacteries, hard to see in the picture, uh, and he's reading from the Torah scroll. Overall, it's a, a very joyous occasion, socially similar to a baptism in the church today. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began searching for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. So it's a bit troubling for us to think of losing track of a child, but our parents and grandparents probably played outside and were simply expected to be home for dinner by their by their parents. So in, in the early stages of their departure from Jerusalem, there could have been hundreds, maybe even thousands of people heading north, and it was probably assumed that the kids were all playing together. Jesus was, for all intents and purposes, an adult and, and didn't necessarily need to be under the constant watchful eye of his parents. So when he didn't show up for dinner, we could, you know, use that tongue-in-cheek, um, then, then his parents started to get worried. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. So note the three days. He was absent for three days. We're going to see that this theme recurs repeatedly in the Bible, and it should always get our attention because we know that he was in the tomb three days. Uh, in Genesis 1, the third day is the day where God says it was good twice. So it's considered a day of double blessing. Um, in John chapter 2, we're going to see the wedding at Cana, and it begins on the third day was the wedding. Luke's description here of the scene, according to Lancaster, he says it squares well with the Talmud, which records that the respected Pharisees of a Sanhedrin would have sat on the terrace of the temple to discuss Torah. One thing that may not be immediately apparent is that the temple complex is huge. It's about uh, 35 acres. So uh, if you can imagine a lot of people milling about, it might have been difficult to, uh, to find Jesus. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. We're probably not appreciating the nonverbal cues here. In no way is Jesus being snotty or disrespectful. The command to honor your father and mother is you know, one of the Ten Commandments. Um, very important. Jesus would not have violated that. We'll see in verse 51, Jesus is submissive to them. In light of what they had already been re revealed to them uh, back when he was born, and in the sense is they should have known where, where to look and that something special was about Jesus. Another thought is that Joseph and Mary likely would have been very proud of their oldest son involved in such a high-level adult discussion with the elite sages. So uh, let, let's look at this from different ways. He wasn't at all being disrespectful. So that brings us to our discipleship precept for this lesson, which we call Walking in His Dust. And we note that Jesus respectfully but unapologetically explained to his parents that the study of the word took priority at that particular moment. Jesus would later use his deep knowledge of scripture to fend off the devil's attacks. And that's a lesson for us because as we grow in Talmudim, as we grow in disciples, we want to be just like Jesus. And that means among our other necessary priorities, so we have to work, we have to tend to our families, all that's important, 
but we do need to dedicate time to be uh, consistently studying the word and doing it intentionally and seriously. We have no idea when our time of temptation will come, but the one thing we can do now is to be as prepared as possible by having that deep relationship with Jesus and his word. So our verse that we're reminded of this is 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. So as the commandment says, he honored his father and mother. His mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So it's not exactly accurate to say we don't know anything about Jesus' childhood um, other than the temple incident because verse 52 tells us a lot. And as Chuck Missler used to say, how would you like to be Jesus' younger brother or sister? Um, You've got this perfect (laughs) older sibling who always does everything right. Right. Um, he earns favor with God and man. Um, and so uh, that's that's who Jesus was in his childhood. Again, I don't hesitate to recommend uh, the following the Messiah series. So in the description, I'll link to the next segment that ties into the last part of our study when the family returns from Egypt to Nazareth and then it, it investigates the episode at the temple when Jesus was 12. So uh, very good. What was Jesus like as a child in the following the Messiah episode? So I'll take our application from that following the Messiah episode where uh, the pastor who uh, hosted the series, Jeremy DeHutt, says, No one would have been attracted to Jesus because of his education or his zip code. If anyone was attracted to him, it was for what he taught, what he did, and who they believed him to be. And so our application is, are we attracted to Jesus for the right reasons? We're going to see all throughout his ministry, there are the the followers, there are the fans, and then there are the the faithful disciples. And so each each of us uh, has that choice to make, whether we're going to be just a fan or whether we're going to be true followers in, uh, in, in discipleship. So next time we'll look at John the Baptist. And then after that, we will get into uh, the baptism and temptation of Jesus and then his public ministry. So we'll see you next time. We hope you've enjoyed this lesson. For more information, find us on the web, www.talmudimway.org.